optimized approach to the care of the uh, sick or injured kid. So I bet I know why you are all here. Probably all of us have this sneaking, nagging fear like, uh-oh, we're going to have a kid, a really sick kid, and we're not going to know what to do, or I'm not going to be entirely comfortable, or the kid's going to have something, and I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to know how to manage this or make this diagnosis. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. The truth is, all of us here feel that way. There's always a little bit of discomfort when the stakes are high, particularly in the sick or injured uh, kid. Let's talk a little bit about why that is. So kids are a little bit different, right? We have to know so much, the neonate versus the adolescents. There's just a different set of issues, of communication challenges, conversations, the differential diagnosis is different. Um, you also have a lot of other players involved. You have parents uh, and you have interesting dynamics. And additionally, when you're resuscitating a child, particularly if you're somebody who takes care of adults most of the time, uh, you know, I mean, it's like in adults, it probably shouldn't be this way, but it's sort of one size fits all in, in most medications and equipment sizes. Um, but with kids, you have to do calculations and you have to, um, you know, not everybody knows where, where the ET tube size is, etc. And the other issue that I find when I care, when I work in the pediatric emergency department, so I did emergency medicine training and then I did a pediatric fellowship, so I do about half and half clinically, um, is that I find sometimes I have this uh, normalcy bias that I have to fight, right? Because most kids have self-limited viral infections. Every once in a while, it's not. And I have to make myself sort of consider, could this be something more serious than a simple URI or a simple AGE? So some def definitions about kid. Kids, uh, neonate, that is generally referred to as the first one month of life. Infant, one month to one year. Toddler age is one to three years. Uh, preschool age is usually that sort of three to five year. And then school age, um, sometimes three to 12 gets lumped in, um, five to 12. And then adolescence is 12 to 18, though there, it's pretty clear, especially if you, you know, I work with college students, um, not everything is entirely developed until probably mid, mid 20s. And the challenge with kids, I mentioned, is that sometimes the differential depends, is, is, is different depending on the age. So look at this uh, uh, slide here. If we have a chief complaint of vomiting and abdominal pain, well, our differential, what we're thinking about, what we're worried about is very different depending on the age. So if I have a neonate that's more than spit up actually vomiting, well, I'm kind of concerned. Okay, what's going on? Is this malrotation? Is there something, something anatomically wrong with that GI tract that things aren't going through? Uh, an infant, oh, I'm a little bit more worried about UTI, but I always have to think about vomiting infant. I always have to think about intussusception. That's the most important surgical emergency in that age. And look at this kid on the side, that crying toddler. Aren't you glad this slide doesn't have sound? Right? <laughs> I'm so glad. I, you know, I really hope that crying toddler just has simple AGE. And look, he's making tears. Great. Get him out of that emergency department and get us our peace uh, much more quickly. Older kids, you're thinking, okay, more adult-like illnesses. And you always have to think, okay, could this be ectopic or canna cannabis hyperemesis? That's a, you know, another differential, um, which is different based on age. It's important to know developmental stages of kids because you need to know sort of what is possible. And I love the schematic. It's in, in the book. This was from one of my attendings in, during fellowship. Uh, used to sort of quiz us on the head to toe, what is developmentally possible? If a parent comes in and says, yeah, my four month old walked into this hot bath, bath you're like, okay, you know, I know that's not possible. But knowing these uh, subtleties, and, and I have to confess, um, I had twins, um, and then a surprise, so I had three kids in diapers. But when my twins were very little, I was trying so hard, I didn't produce enough milk for them both, so I was breastfeeding one twin. 
and my other twin, my husband was holding her. He went to go heat up a bottle and she was right there. He set her down. She was crying because she was hungry, set her on the couch and she was right there next to me, but just out of reach. And she was, this was the twin, you know, they all, they had different personalities. You could tell this twin literally flipped, did circles around her sister in the womb. Um, but she was crying so much that she kind of kicked herself off the couch. And um, which was horrible, and I saw it, and I couldn't, I couldn't reach her. And my husband was like, "Oh no, we need to take her in." I was like, I, "You know, thankfully she had not a scratch on her." But I was like, "We can't take her in because no one's going to believe us that this happened. She's not developmentally able um, to, uh, you know, to do this." And it was horrible. And thankfully she was, she was fine. Um, and I, I realized I'm much less judgmental after having kids of my own parents. But thankfully, I think the key there is, uh, I tell you that story. She had not a scratch on her, and she was behaving fine. Um, if injur kids are injured, um, that's a different story. Um, but you have to know these developmental stages. We also have to know what is normal vital signs. Um, this is important. This is sort of an oversimplification, but you can have sort of an idea of what is normal in a kid, what is not. Uh, especially, you know, in, in pediatric blood pressure. I'll never forget, I took care of this terrible motor vehicle accident where the adults were severely injured, had pelvic fractures. We were, um, did a thoracotomy on one member and then another one. And, and the baby that was in the car was totally fine, not a scratch on him, uh, cooing and moving his arms. And the, our nurses were so uncomfortable with his normal blood pressure because um, the kid was clearly fine. So we have to know what is normal. I do want to say something about pediatric blood pressure though, because kids, have incredible resting sympathetic tone and they hold onto their blood pressure, sometimes despite being very sick or injured. So a septic kid doesn't have to be uh, you don't have to have hypotension. A traumatically injured kid can have normal blood pressure even if they're actively hemorrhaging. So, so it's a big pitfall. And this slide has the minimally acceptable blood pressure, that fifth percentile, which is if it's going down, that's before they, pro they usually take, tank. Some people argue that we should, when we talk about pediatric blood pressure, we should do the 50th percentile, which would be, you know, add, uh, it'd be age times two plus 90. But again, big pitfall is that kids hold on to their blood pressure, so don't be falsely reassured by a normal blood pressure. The other interesting uh, thing, a great challenge, but sometimes frustrating, is that kids have just unique injury patterns. They have diagnoses that I didn't even know about um, when I was a general EM you know, resident. And I went to fellowship and I learned so many, I'm like, oh gosh, I've never heard of this. How many times have I seen this and missed this diagnosis? I'll never forget though, I, one of my first days of fellowship, I had a five-year-old that had acute cholecystitis. And everybody was like, oh my goodness, wow, how did you make that diagnosis? I'm like, don't be impressed. Like, they, I just see adults. Like, this looks exactly like every other cholecystitis that I, you know, made the uh, diagnosis. But I was really scared about missing those diagnoses that I just wasn't as familiar with, wasn't as comfortable with. There's unique, uh, you know, so I mentioned unique fracture patterns, orthopedic conditions, like, uh, you know, skiffy. Um, we don't see that in adults. That's a uniquely pediatric condition. And as we mentioned, right, the differential di diagnosis really varies based on your age. And, you know, additionally, we have challenges of history taking. So we have a lot of pre-verbal kids, which it's, you know, you get about as good of a history as you do from a, your dog. Um, you don't understand what's uh, going on. And um, then you also have the challenge of parents and parents have, you know, certain concerns and certain agendas. And sometimes that can be extra challenging. So it's not fun to be in the emergency department. There's some things that we can do to make this a little bit better on kids to sort of help smooth that relationship, facilitate our ability to care for kids. So having child-friendly rooms, um, activities and distractions. Oh, I'm so glad I'm practicing emergency medicine in the day and age of cell phones um, because that saved me in many uh, lacerations or difficult procedures. Um, so we really need to do what we can to minimize the discomfort uh, we can uh, 
administer a lot of medications in the needleless uh, um, uh, form just to decrease the pain of, of sticks, et cetera. Uh, I do this in adults too, um, especially in our patients um, that have some fear of needles. I will go to the pediatric area and get my EMLA or LET just to you know, improve the experience for everybody, but particularly in kids, and this is important. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do just to minimize pain of procedures. The other thing that is really important for us to remember when we care for kids is we need to be very judicious with our ordering of imaging. Because if anyone's going to suffer the consequences of radiation, it's going to be the young child. They have their entire life to develop the sequelae. Uh, and so it's very important not to have that attitude of, oh, headache or minor head bump, let's just get that CT. We have to be very judicious about that. And we'll talk about those in specific um, conditions. But you know, uh, um, we've done, uh, made a lot of strides in pediatric head trauma, decreasing scans, doing ultrasounds first for appendicitis, focusing, focusing on MRI for um, stroke, and even for appendicitis um, as second line. Uh, so we've made a lot of improvements in, in those areas. So what kills kids? Uh, it really in that first year of life, as expected, congenital anomalies, um, complications of prematurity, accidents, very common. We have an entire lecture on malignancies in kids, and unfortunately, homicide is a big killer as well. Malpractice claims, so what do we do wrong in kids? Not surprisingly, um, for these first two groups, cardiopulmonary conditions leading to arrest or death are one of the most common causes for malpractice claims. And meningitis for the young kid, we're gonna talk about that during our fever, sort of the subtle diagnosis, as you can imagine. There's real sequelae, morbidity and mortality of missing meningitis. And uh, appendicitis, interestingly, note, it is in all three of these age groups. So missed appendicitis. Appendicitis is the most common surgical emergency in kids. Uh, so you, we are likely to see it if it presents atypically, right? Kids under two, well, less common of a diagnosis in a, in a young kid. It's really difficult to make that diagnosis, but be aware of the fact that it does happen. It's more common, you know, 10 and up, but it can happen even in little kids, and unfortunately, it is a big cause of malpractice claims. GU disorders, um, you can see, is in the kids and um, adolescents, a very common uh, sort of mal a reason for malpractice claims. And I know this from the literature, but also practical experience. We've had over the years, there's been so many cases, um, unfortunately, of kids particularly adolescent boys that were too embarrassed. They'll come in for belly pain or some sort of nonspecific thing. They're too embarrassed to, to say that they have a mass on their testicle or their testicles red and painful and swollen. Uh, and we miss that diagnosis of torsion or, or testicular tumor. There's one day I have to tell uh, you my big education uh, fail on this. So I, I harp on this, I, I lecture, I talk uh, um, on shift all the time. And I was talking to my residents uh, and medical students one day, we had a kid who had sort of vague belly pain, an adolescent and vomiting. And I told them, I'm like, listen, I told them about these cases of missed torsion or missed uh, um, you know, testicular cancer. And I'm like, we really have to check, do a GU exam. So the female medical school student went and examined this patient and she felt a mass. So then the female resident went in and felt, you know, and she's like, oh yeah, we do feel a mass. So, so of course I had to go in and feel the testicle and I'm like, oh guys, this is just the epididymis. Um, and so this poor teenager had not one, not two, but three GU exams by female medical providers. And that was uh, unfortunate. Uh, he, he and his mom, I talked to them, thankfully, but they're you know, initially like, what is up with this place? I'm never coming back here again, <laughs> right? Um, so do the GU exam. Uh, some tricks in caring for kids um, and examining them. So we can get a lot of information from just observing a child from a distance. We sort of the window exam, watch how they're acting and interacting with their parents. Um, utilize their parents. Um, sometimes I will have parents do things or even, you know, if a kid, a young toddler really doesn't want me even near him or touching him, I will sort of distract and say, hey mom, put your hand right here. And then I'll, I'll push on the belly over the mom's hand. I, you know, you kind of get 
got to get creative. Um, distraction, thankfully, is a big, big help in kids, particularly the, uh, the young. And be creative in your games. Have them hop or jump or do various things. And sometimes it just takes you know, time and patience and reassessment. Uh, there have been, I explained this to the parents before I do this, but there's been times when I really wanna see a kid walk and, and we can't get them to walk. Um, but I've, I've, you know, with warning to the family, I've taken kids away from their parents and set them down. They usually run right to their parents and I can get a great neuro exam or assess if that leg is really hurting them um, in that. So you have to just be creative and sometimes it takes time. I go to great lengths to make a fool out of my myself in front of kids trying to just um, win them over and um, usually you can you can get that exam if you're just a little bit patient now caring for kids is I think medication dosing is the worst part of about taking care of, uh, of kids I'm doing math in my head I'm not great at it especially at three in the morning if somebody's very sick and so utilize um, these you know there's just a lot of systems to help prevent medication error utilize these systems um, use a brazolutin tape use apps use pharmacy if you have have it just to decrease medication error but also to help you channel your glucose and your energy on caring for the kid in front of you you don't want to waste all your energy doing the math there's a lot of tools out there to help you. Some pointers for winning with kids. As much as you can, um, age appropriately, talk, know, know the ch child's name and talk to them. Our pediatricians are so good at that, um, really getting down at their level, looking at them, uh, um, talking to them, asking them questions as much as you can if it's age appropriate. And explain, kids are curious, take advantage of that. Explain what you're doing and why for twofold. One, you're explaining to the kid and you're like, oh, isn't that cool? I can look inside your ear, you know, and um, explain what they're doing. And they really sometimes get into it, a kid that wouldn't necessarily have buy-in otherwise. And parents love this too, um, which we'll talk about that next slide. You want to, I mean, again, age appropriate, ask permission, may I examine you? Um, just it shows that you respect them and respect their boundaries. Uh, I think it's also very important to never lie to kids. Uh, don't say it's not gonna hurt if it is. Now I'm not saying, hey, ooh, this is gonna really hurt. Like don't, you know, you don't have to be too honest, but you know, selectively uh, um, sort of choose your words, but, but don't lie to kids. And the other thing is, all of us went into medicine. Um, sometimes it's hard when uh, kids don't like you. We went into medicine because we want to help people and we want to make a difference. And um, sometimes our patients don't like us or don't treat us with too much respect. I always tell my undergrads that are thinking about going into medicine, I'm like, listen, if you want prestige or money, uh, maybe medicine isn't isn't the place for you. you you're, I'm like, let me tell you the list of bad names I've been called in just this week. You know, it's it's a you know you're not going to get as much money or as much prestige as you think in medicine. Um, but it's important not to give that uh, um, power over you, right? The toddler it's not going to like you always. The adolescent, a wise pediatrician once told me, it's like you know you have to remember that adolescence is hard for them too. And so having empathy and compassion and seeing past their sort of gruff exterior as somebody that has insecurities and vulnerabilities, um, I think really helps. With parents, um, so parents can be challenging, I get that. Um, it is important to, you know, we have one mouth and two ears for a reason. I've heard many sermons on that, right? Be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to, slow to be anger, uh, angry, and James. Um, it's really important to sort of listen to parents and address their concerns. Sometimes if parents really just feel like you listened and heard, even if there's like a, diff a difficult dynamic, they want you to do something that you don't think is medically indicated. If you listen to them and acknowledge that and then align with them, say, okay, I, I'm with you. You know, I don't want to miss a brain bleed in your child either. I'm in medicine because I care for, about kids. Or, oh, I get it. Man, it's hard when your kid is sick and they're miserable and you there's nothing you can do. I'm like, I get that as a parent. Just really empathizing um, with their concerns is really, really important. I mentioned this when with the winning with kids. 
every parent, so we know as clinicians, right, you don't have to listen to the heart and lungs of every patient. Um, you, you just, you don't. Um, but, and you also don't have to look in the ears. You don't have to do a lot of the exam. But parents come into the emergency department because they have a concern. They come seeking your your expertise and your knowledge. And it makes them feel better if you examine their child head to toe. And it, you know, we all know that sometimes we can like look into a room and assess and like basically that's all the clinical assessment that we need. Um, but parents don't realize that. They don't realize what you're doing. So doing these things, going through, looking in their ears, I mean, that is the most, as an academic physician, I have a lot of residents that see my kids, see kids, and then I go in and talk to parents. The number one complaint from parents were like, that resident did not look in my kid's ear. Like for like that was such a, um, a, a consistent complaint. So you know, look head to toe, but also tell them what they're doing. If you're watching the child, look at your child. They're breathing comfortably. Look at the oxygen saturation. Just sort of state the obvious. It's obvious to us, but parents don't necessarily know that it's obvious um, as much as you can. So detail verbally your examination uh, uh, findings, and always you know. Don't hesitate to reassess child, uh, the child, um, update them. And, you know, if you're ever in the position where a family or a nurse, especially if a nurse requests you to reassess them, I know it's sometimes tempting to say, I just examined them, they're fine, let them go home. But your answer should always be, yes, I will do that right away. Um, because, uh, you know, even if their child is fine, it's going to leave a bad taste in their mouth if you don't do that. And also nurses um, are going to remember that if you disregard that. That's important for your relationship with, your, with nursing, but also with kids, because things do change, right? That AGE may be becoming acute appendicitis in front of your eyes. That that you or I may be becoming acute meningitis and maybe you'll pick that up. And last, uh, and always, you know, detail instructions and ask parents, okay, anything else? Is there, do you have any other concerns? What else can I address for you? Um, that really helps them feel heard. And probably the most important piece of advice that I can give you um, is to enjoy uh, the, the child. Um, kids are cute and fun and have fun. Life is too short, you know, have fun yes. with them. And I've very, met very few parents who don't love it when you sort of fawn over their children. That really gets buy-in with parents. So winning with a diagnosis is a sort of medicine 101. It's important to generate a differential diagnosis. I mean, we all know that. That's been um, for, since day one of our training. Um, just to know the diagnosis, um, consider diagnosis, think about, okay, what bad thing could this be and why is it not? Confirming, uh, confirming what, what confirmatory test do I need? Because um, if you don't know the diagnosis, if you don't consider the diagnosis, you don't make that diagnosis. I mentioned already time declares a lot. Sometimes it just is um, you need to get sort of buy-in from the kid. That kid needs to calm down so you can get an exam. Or over time, okay, is that just nausea and vomiting, um, sort of belly pain? Or is that really significant discomfort that I should be worried about appendicitis? Reevaluate all status changes, as we said, and return instructions are important. We have a great opportunity in the emergency department for educational opportunities. There's been a few studies showing that parents actually listen better if their kid is acutely injured or ill. Um, so we have the opportunity, um, you know, an advantage uh, of just taking advantage of these moments about, you know, water safety, accident prevention, helmet wearing. I always tell kids, I'm like, hey, last I checked, we don't do brain transplants, so hey, let's let's wear a helmet and car seats, etc. As far as um, you know, procedures and family presence, you know, you'll have to decide risk versus benefit depending on the procedure. But one thing that's pretty clear in the literature is that family should be present during a resuscitation for a lot of reasons. And it's a strong recommendation by the AHA to have family present during a pediatric resuscitation because it has been demonstrated to decrease stress, anxiety, PTSD-related um, symptoms in families. Um, and, and really, it sort of demonstrates to parents and families that, wow, they really did everything. They cared for my kid. We, they went to great lengths to save my child, and my child was not able to be uh, resuscitated. So with that, everybody buckle your seatbelts. Get ready. This is going to be a jam-packed uh, three days. 